Hey everybody, this is Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in beautiful Kerrville, Texas. Welcome back to another episode of ATP Ask the Pastor. Today's question is about the Lord's Supper in John chapter 6. Someone asks, Dear Pastor, can John 6, 52 to 56 be used as a proof text for the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper? Well, let's check it out and see. John chapter 6, verse 52, The Jews therefore strove amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Thus far the text. So can this text that we just read be used as a proof text for the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper? When we say real presence, we mean that Christ is physically, corporally, uh, truly present in the Lord's Supper under the forms of bread and wine. Now, the short answer to your question is no. And there are two main reasons why this isn't a good idea to argue for the real presence from John chapter 6. The first reason is that when you're dealing with the Lord's Supper, always, always, always start and finish with the words of institution, uh, the words with which Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and 1 Corinthians. There he says, take, eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood uh, shed for you for the remission of sins then. When Jesus gives us a word, what do we do with it? Faith simply believes the words of Jesus. Faith takes the words of Jesus as they are and, and, and doesn't ask the question of, well, explain this to me. Help me figure this out then. So uh, this means that that bread is simultaneously the very body of Christ, which was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried resurrected on the third day, ascended into heaven, it reigns at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Uh, the same thing with his wine, uh, with the wine, it is his true blood. And this is so simply because he says. The person who wants to rationalize the words of Jesus away, uh, arguing for a symbolic or a merely spiritual presence, uh, will not be swayed by arguments from anywhere else in Scripture if they're not swayed by the clear words of Jesus. Now, if you're wondering, in Greek, the word estin always means is. It never means symbolizes. It never means represents. Um, again, you know, as, a, as an argument uh, that the Lutheran fathers always used, uh, you know, this is his last will and testament, and so you're not allowed to use symbolic or figurative language in your own last will and testament. Uh, so uh, the sacramentarians ha have always wanted to do violence to this clear and simple passage of Scripture, these clear and simple words of Christ. A sacramentarian, I should back up. Uh, that's a word, uh, and a title that uh, the Lutherans have always given uh, to those who want to deny the real presence of Christ and say there's no presence at all or there's only a spiritual presence. Uh, and so they just don't take the words of Christ as they are. Is means is. Now the second reason why we don't rely upon this text, John chapter 6, uh, as a proof text for Christ's real presence in the Lord's Supper is the text itself. Two things about this. First of all, uh, we know that John chapter 6 isn't specifically about the Lord's Supper because the sacrament hasn't been instituted yet. So chronologically speaking, John 6 is here and the sacrament uh, is here on the night in which he was betrayed then. Uh, so there's no reason to think that Jesus would be teaching a bunch of unbelieving Jews about it when he, has, he hasn't even instituted it for his own apostles yet. Now, Jesus does speak of baptism already in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, but that's different because baptism had already been instituted and was already within use. Uh, by the time Jesus speaks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, John the Baptist had been baptizing countless folks out of the Jordan River then, and Nicodemus as a leader of the Jews would have known that then. The unfaithful crowd in John chapter 6 had never heard of the Lord's Supper though because it hadn't been instituted. More importantly though in this, and this is probably the most important point, is verse 53. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. The eating and drinking which Christ teaches then, based on verse 53, are necessary so that you have life in you. So it's simple. No eating and no drinking, no life within you. 
This means then that the Lord's Supper would be a necessity for salvation. And Jesus and Paul never speak of the Lord's Supper in this way. Uh, now, there is a necessity to baptism, according to the command of Christ in uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Mark 16, 16. And the necessity of baptism is why the church has always allowed for uh, laymen to baptize in the case of actual emergencies. There has never been a case of emergency Lord's Supper because it's not an absolute necessity. Uh, if participation in the Lord's Supper is made into an absolute necessity uh, in order to have life in you, then this is going to lead you to all sorts of strange and unbiblical places, excuse me, uh, the chief of which would be infant communion, like the Eastern Church has. Uh, so now, what is Jesus speaking of then in John chapter 6? Well, he's clearly talking about an eating and drinking that's necessary to have life. Uh, and so what do we do with this? Well, we can see what Luther and the Reformers did with this. They taught that this is a spiritual eating and drinking. Uh, now, let's go to the formula of Concord. If you've been following me for a while, you've probably got one of these blue Dow Benti Book of Concords from Repristination Press. If not, get one there on Amazon.com. We want to go to the formula of Concord, Solid Declaration, Article 7, beginning with paragraph 61. If you got your blue Book of Concord, we're on page 269, right-hand column, very end, last full paragraph. There is, therefore, a twofold eating of the flesh of Christ, one spiritual, of which Christ treats especially in John 6, 54, which occurs in no other way than with the spirit and faith, in the preaching and mediation of the gospel, as well as in the Lord's Supper, and by itself is useful and salutary and necessary at all times for salvation to all Christians, without which spiritual participation also the sacramental or oral eating in the supper is not salutary, but even injury, injurious and damning. But this spiritual eating is nothing else than faith namely to hear God's word, wherein Christ, true God and true man, is presented to us together with all his benefits that he has purchased for us by his flesh, given into death for us, and by his blood shed for us, namely God's grace and the forgiveness of sins, righteousness, and eternal life, and to receive it with faith and to appropriate it to ourselves, and in all troubles and temptations firmly to rely with sure confidence and trust and to abide in the consolation that we have a gracious God. And then it goes on. And so the eating and drinking that Christ speaks of here, according to the Lutheran fathers then, is faith in his word. Now this jives with what Jesus says in John chapter 6 about this eating and drinking being necessary because faith is necessary for salvation. No one is justified apart from faith in Christ's promises. Uh, and so what he's telling the crowd in John chapter 6 is, feast on me, believe my teaching, uh, that this is the body that I'm giving for the life of the world in my atoning death upon the cross. This isn't so foreign to the Gospels. If we think about Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 16, there Jesus tells a parable of this great supper that everyone is invited to. And what is the great supper that the Lord has prepared for all people? It's the Gospel. So what do you do with the great supper? You eat it. You drink it. And how do we eat and drink Christ spiritually? By faith in his word. Now, there is also then, as the formula said, a sacramental eating, an oral eating of Christ in the sacrament. That's what Jesus bids us to do in the words of institution. What that means is, uh, when you eat and drink Christ's body and blood sacramentally, uh, you, you must also be believing the words, this is my body given for you, this is my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. And the formula goes on in the next paragraph or so uh, to address that as well. So in all of this, John 6 really shouldn't be used to prove Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. Uh, I'd stay away from it because of these issues with the text, especially the issue in verse 53 of necessity. Uh, instead, when you're talking about the Lord's Supper and extolling the great benefits that it gives uh, and what it is, stick with the words of institution. Believe them and firm, believe them firmly without doubting uh, that in that supper he gives you his true body and blood to eat and drink and through that true body and blood gives you his gracious promise of forgiveness, life, and salvation then. Thanks for your question. Real good one today. Uh, keep them coming. ATPHolyCross at gmail.com. That's ATPHolyCross at gmail.com. Send your question in. We'll put you in the queue and we'll get to you as soon as we can. We'll see you next time.